Welcome back to Chem 4300. In this video, we're going to begin Chapter 8, which covers the physics of wave motion. Now, one of the primary objectives of a physical chemistry class is to learn how to use quantum mechanics to understand the structure and the motion of atoms and molecules. Now, quantum mechanics can be conceptually and, and even philosophically difficult to grasp. And what makes it even more difficult is that it requires quite a number of prerequisite physics concepts. Now, we've already reviewed a number of important concepts, such as Newtonian physics describing translational motion and rotational motion and vibrational motion. Now, at the turn of the last century, there was all this growing evidence of strange behaviors at the microscopic level that was leading people to believe that maybe we could apply the classical theory of waves to understand what we're seeing. Now, the classical theory of waves had pre-existed quantum theory by about 150 years. So at that time, they've already known for 150 years how to describe classical waves, things like water waves or sound waves or, and even light waves. Now, most of the chemistry students that you know, take this course, they, they've had very limited exposure to the physics of, of waves and the mathematics of the classical wave equation. So how to describe these kind of things is not something that we're that familiar with. So the purpose of this chapter is to really introduce you to those concepts and give you a more sound mathematical basis for understanding how we describe waves. Now the good news is that this chapter is going to teach you about many different types of waves, like I said, sound and water and light waves, all these things we're going to learn how to understand. And all of these concepts will carry over when we get to quantum mechanics. So hopefully, by the time we get to quantum, you'll understand these concepts about wave motion very nicely in your head. You'll have them all clear. And then when we get to all the weirdness of quantum mechanics, we'll, you can just focus on that stuff and not have to be overwhelmed by learning about waves at the same time. OK, so let's talk first about what we mean by a wave. And so a wave is a self-sustaining disturbance in a continuous medium that can move through space without transporting the medium. So you can imagine, for example, a, a tsunami wave, which is a moving across the ocean. So as it's moving across the ocean, it's carrying a tremendous amount of energy and momentum, you know, particularly if it hits the shore, right? So as that tsunami moves across the ocean, the medium, which is the water, is only being displaced up and down. So it's not being transported with the wave. So what we see is that the water is undergoing a local displacement and from some equilibrium position. So here's the sea level, and it might be raised up, and then maybe down and back up. But that's it. The water doesn't move with the wave as it goes across the ocean you know, and, and transfers its energy and momentum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, we're going to classify waves into two types. There's going to be transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Now, a transverse wave is a wave that moves the displacement is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating. So that, for example, that tsunami wave would be an example of a wave which, that's transverse. Whereas a longitudinal wave is a wave that's parallel to the direction of the wave propagation. So sound waves, or me speaking right now, is a longitudinal wave that's moving towards the microphone. Uh, another nice example where you have both types of waves, transverse and longitudinal waves, are earthquakes. Earthquakes start somewhere deep in the Earth uh, at a point that's called the hypocenter. This is where there's some shift in the, in the plates or something happens that causes a disturbance, and that disturbance propagates up to the surface. So you, usually you think about earthquakes as occurring at an epicenter, and the epicenter is the spot on the Earth's surface where you feel the earthquake and it's directly over the hypocenter. So the hypocenter is where it starts. Directly above it is the epicenter. So there are two types of waves that occur when an earthquake is happening. One is a longitudinal wave. So when the, the, when the uh, whatever happens down here at the, at the, at the uh, hypocenter occurs, it causes a compressive wave that goes up and travels to the surface. And it also causes a transverse wave. So there's this back and forth motion and so that it, as it goes up towards the surface. Now, the reason this one's called a primary wave and this one's called a secondary wave is that the primary wave moves faster 
than the secondary wave. So when the, when the hypocenter event occurs, then what happens is that this wave, the primary wave goes up and that's the first one that you feel. So if, you're, if you've ever been in an earthquake and you had the presence of mind to, to observe everything that's going on, you might notice that the first thing you feel is this up and down motion, which is this primary wave hitting you. But then that's followed by the slower wave, which is the secondary wave, which is a transverse wave, which causes everything to shake back and forth. And in fact, actually, if you could time the difference between when you initially felt the, the primary wave to the time it takes to do the secondary wave, you can actually work out where the hypocenter, how far down the hypocenter is from the epicenter. This is actually one of the problems that we're going to do in the homework. <clears throat> Now, if we're going to describe a wave, we're going to find some mathematical function that's going to describe the medium at every point in space and as a function of time. So we're going to call this the wave function. It describes the displacement of the medium as a function of position and as a function of time. Okay? And this wave function is going to be a solution to a single partial differential equation that's called the wave function for the medium. So you can imagine, as you think about waves that you've seen, that you can have all kinds of different wave shapes. All of those wave shapes in the medium can be described by uh, multiple different types of wave functions, but all of those wave functions are going to be the solution to one differential equation called the wave equation for that medium. Now, we're going to be looking at two types of waves equations. One is a linear wave equations and nonlinear wave equations. Actually, we're only going to be looking at linear wave equations. But we're going to divide those wave equations as into, into linear and nonlinear based on whether their partial differential equation is linear or nonlinear. So if you remember that when we're talking about differential equations, if the equa differential equation is linear in the function and all of its derivatives, then that's called a linear differential equation. So it takes some form like this one here. If the differential equation involves the square of or some power of one of these uh, derivatives or some transcendental function of one of these guys, then it would become a nonlinear differential equation. But what's important is that the waves we're going to look at are going to be in this category where they're described by linear wave equations. And what's important about linear wave equations or linear partial differential equations is something called the superposition principle. So any solution to a linear partial differential equation can be added together to other for solutions to form new solutions. So <clears throat> if we take some set of solutions, say we have sinusoidal solutions to our, our partial differential equation, our linear partial differential equation, we can take all that complete set of of sinusoidal solutions and add them together to get some new solution that doesn't even look like a sinusoid. It doesn't matter because all of those solutions, the sinusoidal solutions, can be added up in, in a linear superposition to give us any other solution to the wave equation. This is something that we'll exploit a lot in this chapter and when we get to quantum mechanics because the waves in quantum mechanics will also follow the superposition principle. So all waves that are modeled by linear partial differential equations will obey this superposition principle. Now, nonlinear waves, ones that are modeled by nonlinear partial differential equations, may not have this superposition principle apply. And generally, nonlinear waves is where, are waves where you have very large amplitudes. Uh, if you think about when we were looking at uh, vibrational motion, we learned that we can model vibrational motion as uh, a, a a potential energy surface that was parabolic, and that as long as the motion wasn't very, amplitude wasn't very large, then that parabolic potential was a good description of the vibrational motion. But for large amplitudes, if we're looking like, say, diatomic molecule, we saw that there were anharmicities that we had to add in. As the vibration got larger amplitude, it deviated from parabolic uh, potential energy surface. So it's the same thing here. The, the medium is being displaced from some equilibrium as the wave is moving. And if that displacement is small, then it's kind of a parabolic dependence. And that sort of leads, that's what leads to this linear differential equation. But if the amplitude of the displacement starts to become larger, then you have anharmicities, and that's when you have to start putting in nonlinear partial differential equations to describe the wave. 
So it all goes back to 1746 where uh, d'Alembert discovered that one equation can be used to describe all linear waves in one dimension. So this was the equation that he found. This partial differential equation is the master equation for all linear waves in 1D. So this f of x and t is, is the wave function and vp here is the speed at which the wave is, is moving in the medium. And so you can see it's just the second partial derivative with respect to time is equal to the wave speed squared times the second partial derivative uh, with respect to position. Right. So let's take this equation here and let's look at some examples of how this applies. So this is vp again is the wave speed. That depends on the medium that you're moving in. So for example, if I had a string, uh, like on a guitar string or a violin or uh, a, a harp, for example, then the, this wave equation would apply for describing the string uh, waves and the speed at which that wave moves is going to be given by the square root of the tension of the string divided by the mass density of the string. So this equation describes string waves with this uh, uh, speed for the wave. Similarly, this same equation, equation will describe sound waves where now the speed is given by the square root of gamma RT over the molar mass, where gamma is the ratio of the heat capacities, the constant pressure to constant volume heat capacities. So that is the same equation that describes the string waves, also describes sound waves. All that you change is what determines the wave speed. For sound waves and liquids, same equation again, except now the speed is the square root of the bulk modulus divided by the liquid density. Uh, and light, another example. This is the wave equation for light. The speed is Vp is equal to 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. Mu is the magnetic permeability of, sp of the, the space that the, the light is moving in, and E is the electric permittivity of the, the space it's moving in. Okay, now we're going to see examples where, uh, you know, we're going to talk about different types of waves, like the tsunami was a wave that was moving through space. You can think of it like a, a wave pulse, or you're going to see examples of standing waves that you might have, say, on, in a wind, a wind instrument or something like that, uh, a musical instrument. But what we're going to look at is, is this particular case is that whenever you have a wave where the position and the time have a fixed relationship where you can say that the wave function is dependent on x minus vpt, then that wave shape, no matter what it is, will always move forward in time without changing its shape. Now you may have seen waves, we're going to see this in, in this chapter, waves that may go forward, but then as they go forward, they may sort of dampen out and then slowly disappear. But that won't be the case if the wave function is a function that has the position and the time having this fixed relationship. So this is a very special relationship, and this describes a wave that's moving from left to right. So we have x minus vpt describes whatever the wave is, it's going to be moving from left to right. So whatever the wave function is, we're saying the wave function is more specifically dependent on some function of just essentially one variable, we'll call it u, which is x minus vpt. Similarly, uh, you can have solutions that are going from, going from right to left, so a wave that goes the other way, and all you have to do to get that wave function, without changing shape, of course, is that you change the sign here from minus to positive, and that describes a wave that doesn't change shape that's moving from right to left. Now, D'Alembert realized that uh, if he defined these two variables for left left moving waves and right moving waves that he could rewrite his wave equation to be this. So a very simple form if you write it in terms of these variables. And you can see that very quickly that there's, there's a very trivial solution to this, which is that the f function can be written as two solutions, uh, as a sum of two solutions, the, the g solution for u as a function of u and a, f a function h, which is a function of just uh, v here. 
and you can you know, substitute this in and you can see quite clearly if you do the, the partial derivative with respect to u and v that both of these guys will end up being going to zero and you end up with the result up there. So what's important is that the solution then, any solution to the wave equation can be written as a combination of a left to right moving wave and a right to, to left moving wave. Uh, and so that's what we write here in terms of position and time. Now, one of the things we're going to see because of the superposition principle is that uh, we'll, we'll find solutions to our differential equation that will involve sinusoidal solutions. And these sinusoids are very useful because we can add them up to make any kind of wave shape. And so it's very important for us to understand their solutions because whatever we find later in our wave, uh, in our boundary conditions or whatever we're looking at, we can always express that solution as some linear combination of sinusoidal waves. So we want to understand sort of the sinusoidal wave behavior because we're going to be using these solutions a lot. And so one of the reasons, as, as I just said, because of the superposition principle, so if we look at a sinusoidal wave then, we're going to write our sinusoidal wave, we can write it various ways, but I'm going to write it like this for now. So the, the function is some amplitude A and then some say transcendental function, say cosine of an argument which is some constant k times x minus vpt plus some initial phase there. And so a is the amplitude, so I have some pictures here of, of, a, of a sinusoid, and here a is the amplitude of the wave, and vp is the wave velocity, uh, and that's actually, I'll describe here on the next slide too, but that's this position of this dot is moving with the wave velocity. Uh, delta is the constant, and k is going to be the wave number. So this is going to be equal to 2 pi over lambda, and lambda is the distance between two troughs or two adjacent crests there. So this is the spatial periodicity of the wave. So this is what you have for a sinusoid. You can describe a sinusoid by a wave number, uh, which, the, which is given by the different spacing between the adjacent crests or, or troughs. Now, as I said, the wave speed is the, the speed at which this dot moves. So these are different times here. So this is some time zero, this is a little bit time later, and then a little bit later after that one. And you can see if you had a movie of this and you put a dot here and you watch the dot, it would continue to progress forward in time, and that would be the speed that's represented by VP here. That's the wave speed. Now, the period of the wave, the time, if you stood out here and you watched the wave coming at you, going up and down, up and down, then the time it takes for it to go up and down once and, and back to where it was, that's the, the period of the wave, and that's going to be 2 pi over k vp. And of course, the frequency is just the inverse of that, so 1 over the, the period, which will be given by k vp over 2 pi. Now, one thing we have to be careful about in my, my notation here, the, the, the fonts that I'm using, is that this is a Greek symbol nu, and that's the letter V. So there's a slight difference in the font, but just be careful not to confuse them. Actually, we probably won't be using the Greek nu for frequency. We're going to be working with the angular frequency most of the time, and be, be careful not to confuse these two frequencies, because one is in uni different units. This is in radians per second, and this is just inverse seconds. So the angular frequency is 2 pi, times nu, and that's omega, and that's going to be 2 pi over, over the period, or k times vp. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to re it's going to be more common for us to rewrite our wave function in terms of omega uh, instead of vp. So let's do that in the next slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our relationship between the angular velocity and the wave speed which is related by the wave number there. And we're going to change our function. So this was our right traveling wave, which is a times cosine of k times the quantity x minus vpt plus delta. And if we multiply through, then we get k times x. And then when k gets multiplied times vp, that becomes omega. So now this becomes our expression for the right traveling wave. So generally, as we go forward in this chapter, we're going to be sticking with this form, but you just remember that there's always, if you have to go back, you can always do these conversions back. But we're talking about sinusoids here, so this is where it's going to be pretty simple. <clears throat> now, for the left traveling wave, then it's the same thing. 
So what you notice then is that the difference between the right traveling wave and the left traveling wave is the difference in the sign in front of omega. So this one's negative and that one's positive. Now, one of the things that's going to be very useful, and it, it may not seem that way at the moment, but it's going to be very useful, and we'll do a review of complex numbers in a bit here, is to adopt a complex number notation to describe the wave function. And this will make it much easier for to us to make the math more compact, and some of the derivations will be a little simpler if we stick to a complex notation. Now, the wave function is not a complex number. So we're going to use complex numbers, but in the end, if we want the actual wave function, we just have to take the real part of the wave function. But that's just a small price to pay for the extra convenience we're going to get from using complex numbers. So when I talk about the wave that's, that's right traveling wave, which has this form here, I can write it in complex form is by a to e to the i kx minus omega t plus delta, and then that I take the real part of to get the actual wave. And if I was doing a left traveling wave, then it would be the real part of this function here where I just change the sign. So I'm going from using cosine to using this uh, uh, Euler's number here, which is e to the i and to the power of the argument of the cosine there. So this, again, this r means take the real part of a complex number. And if you see a, a script i, that means take the imaginary part of the complex number. Now, if, you, if you're not used to working with complex numbers, then in the next video, I'm going to do a review of complex numbers, and hopefully this will all be a little bit clearer. But as we get to use these things, you'll be comfortable and you'll be glad that we switched to complex number notation. So that will be the next video, uh, and for this one, we're done.